It's your friendly neighborhood bull. Back with another video, Adam Koo here. And in this video, I'll be talking about what will trigger the next explosive bull market and how do you position yourselves and prepare yourselves for it. Now, some people will be wondering, how can you possibly still be bullish at a time like that? Are you nuts? Are you on drugs? After all, we just closed the first half of the year down 20%. And this is the worst decline since 1970, before most of us were born. And this is over the last 52 years. And the majority of people on social media, on official media, believe that things are just going to get a lot worse from here. Why? Because earnings estimates by analysts are too optimistic. They have to come down. Earnings are going to be terrible. And we're going to, we are already in, or we're going to have a huge recession. The greatest recession since 2008, 2000. And the market's only dropped halfway. We've got another halfway more to go. So everyone's talking about it. Is it going to happen? It's human nature to follow the crowd. It's human nature to get scared when everyone gets scared. And again, just because everyone believes it, does it mean it's going to happen? Not really. If you understand the history of the markets and how markets work, it's like what Jesse Livermore, one of the legendary traders have always said, the stock market is never obvious. When everyone thinks something's going to happen, it doesn't happen. When everyone believes the market will move a certain way, the market tends to move opposite of the majority. And that's how the market behaves because the market is designed to fool most of the people most of the time. And that's why you find that great fortunes are made from people who dare to go against the majority, who dare to look crazy, who dare to look different, right? Uh, to buy when others are despondently selling and to sell when others are avidly buying requires the greatest fortitude. And it's, it's not easy because it's natural for human beings to want to be with the crowd because that's the safety in numbers. But that's not how you really create wealth. That's not how you make money. The way you really make money and what I found through my own experience of going through three previous bear markets is to, again, go against the crowd. And that pays the greatest rewards. And what Howard Marks recently said, successful investors have to take uncomfortably idiosyncratic positions. So if you feel that you are doing what's comfortable, it's like you know selling when everyone is selling or buying when everyone is buying and you're doing something comfortable, usually you're doing something wrong. But if you're doing something that seems so uncomfortable, so counterintuitive, usually it's right. And that's why the greatest hockey player in the world said that most players go where the puck is. I go to where the puck will be. So with everyone focused on this bad news, the recession, the bear market, what's the good news lying underneath that everyone is missing, that, that many people are not looking at? And what's this good news that once most people realize it, it's going to totally change the sentiment of the market and lead to an explosive bull market? I'm seeing it right now. So before I talk about it, you've got to first understand What's causing this current decline? Two things. Number one is this inflation shock. So everyone, well, a lot of people thought that inflation was transitory or temporary, but it's been so persistent and inflation has gone up higher and higher to up to 8.6% recently. And that's freaking people out. Why? Because a lot of people believe that the only way to get inflation down is if the Fed tightens monetary policy, raises interest rates aggressively to force the economy into a severe recession. That's the only way to control inflation. And that's what the Fed is doing. So let me give you an analogy. Imagine the economy is like a car. So the car's been going fast, but it's been getting too fast that it's overheating, it's going to explode. That's inflation. So the Fed has no choice but to slow the car down. But the car's going so fast, it's so overheated, people think that the Fed has to slam on the brakes, pull the handbrake in order to slow the car down. Now, if you do that, they're afraid that the car will stall and the economy will go into a severe recession. So that's the fear. Now, understand that the Fed raising interest rates is not a bad thing. It's not a bearish thing. In fact, I've shown you that historically, when the Fed raised interest rates, the market actually went up. I've shown that to you before. So it's not raising interest rates that's bearish for the market. It's raising interest rates too aggressively. So in other words, the car's going really fast and you tap on the brakes, 
slows the car down, that's fine as long as the car keeps going. But if you slam on the brakes too hard and the car stalls, that's a bad thing. So that's the fear right now. The car is going to stall, we're going to get stuck and the car's not going to move anymore. Okay. So that is what's causing the current decline. Now, if, if inflation starts to come down, we're going to have an explosive rally because the moment inflation comes down, then the Fed doesn't have to be so aggressive. They can still raise interest rates, but slower than usual. Boom, the market is going to explode to the upside. Or number two, if, see, everyone's expecting a recession right now and the market has priced in a recession, market has gone down expecting a recession, right? Now, if a recession doesn't happen or if a recession does happen, but not as bad as people fear, boom, the market's going to explode to the upside. So is this possible? Is it possible that inflation is going to come down really soon? And is it possible that we will avoid a recession or we go into recession, but it's a mild one. It's not as bad as the financial crisis or the dot-com crash. Is that possible? Well, let's look at the facts right now. Now, remember that historically, the moment inflation peaks and comes down, that usually signals a bottom in the market and the market will explode to the upside. Now, these slides are from Larry William. So credit to him. I'm kind of like borrowing his slides. I hope he doesn't mind. Um, but these are actually from his video, right? So you can see again, historically, the black line is inflation and the red line is the stock market. And historically, you see whenever inflation peaks and comes down, boom, market bottom, market rallies, right? Inflation peaks, come, comes down, market bottoms, market rallies. And again, many instances of this, historically, inflation peaks, comes down, market bottoms, we have a rally. Inflation peaks, comes down, market bottoms, we've got a rally. Inflation peaks, comes down, market bottoms, we have a rally. So on and so forth. You get the point, all right? So the question is this, is inflation peaking? Has it peaked and is it coming down? All signs are pointing to a yes. Now, everyone is focusing on the current inflation rate and that has not reported to be going down very much yet. In fact, the orange line, which is the current inflation rate, that's still going up. So people are focusing on that. But again, this is in a way a lagging indicator because it's reporting what has been already passed. Okay. So I'm looking instead at the leading indicator, which is the five-year break-even inflation rate. This five-year rate basically tells you what the market expects inflation to be in five years. So this is the leading indicator that you need to watch because this is where the puck is going not where the puck is right now. And there's something really interesting that just happened, which is this five-year rate recently, which is the one in blue, this five-year rate has recently broken its trend line support. So you can see that this was a very strong support and you can see at one stage, it went all the way up to about 4%. This is the five-year rate, right? But recently, it's been coming down, coming down, coming down, and it's broken this critical support, and it's now actually starting to fall significantly. So again, this is a leading indicator. Usually, when the five-year rate falls, the actual inflation rate will start to peak and fall as well. Let's see the. Let's take a look at this relationship. So I'm going to put the inflation rate back, the one in orange, and let's take a look at how they have uh, behaved together. So once again, the blue line is the leading indicator, the five-year rate. The orange line is the current inflation rate. Now you can see that initially, the leading indicator went up, right? The five-year rate went up. And then only sometime later, the inflation rate went up. So again, the blue line is the leading indicator. It leads the orange line. Same thing over here. The blue line, the five-year rate peaks and then drops. And then a couple of weeks or months later, inflation rate peaks and drops. Same thing over here. The blue line peaks and drops, and then the red line peaks and drops. And that's why I keep saying that this blue line is the leading indicator and that is coming down, which means that this red line probably is peaked and is gonna come down really soon. So why is it likely that inflation has peaked and prices are coming down? So first understand that what causes inflation in the first place was excess demand and not enough supply. 
So because of supply chain disruptions, there was not enough goods that stores were holding, right? And you got this demand. So demand, no supply, inflation. Now the opposite is happening. Now there's too much supply or supply is, is coming in and demand is dropping and that causes prices to fall. So the first thing that you notice is that we have what is called the bullwhip effect. The bullwhip effect is a deflationary effect that retailers face in holding too much inventory. Now, if you read the recent reports, you know that now Walmart has too much inventory they can't sell. Target has too much inventory they can't sell. US inventory levels recently at a wholesale and retail level have gone up. So initially you can see that inventories were falling, not enough supply, but now supply is going up, right? So now with Target and Walmart and these retailers having too much inventory, what do they have to do? They have no choice but to cut prices. They have to give discounts to get rid of their goods. And this is a deflationary effect that's happening right now. So that's the first uh, thing that's reversing inflation. The second thing is this. Another main cause of inflation is rising commodity prices, whether it's an agricultural commodity or natural gas and, and all that's been going up, right? You can see it over here. Whoa. Now, this is the commodity ETF, ticker symbol DBC. What has happened recently? Commodities have been collapsing now. And in fact, you can see there was this trend line that it broke over here and it recently broke this support as well. Now, again, there are no guarantees, but it kind of looks like this trend, this uptrend in commodities is now reversing into a downtrend in commodities. So when commodity prices come down, that is a deflationary effect. In addition, unfulfilled orders have fallen for the first time in two years. So this chart shows you the regional unfulfilled orders. And initially, you can see it's been extremely high, which means that a lot of people, they buy things, they don't get their order filled because of supply chain disruptions. So again, not enough supply, a lot of demand, hyperinflation, right? But now for the first time, this has fallen below zero, which means now people's orders are getting fulfilled. They are getting what they want. And again, this is a very deflationary effect. So you can see that the economy is starting to deflate and the moment inflation data comes down lower than expected, the market is gonna have an explosive bull market. Before we move on to the next part of this video, I've got exciting news and announcement. I'll be conducting a free live online event for all my viewers really soon, where I'll go into detail on how I identify and analyze the best stocks in the market that will survive this uncertainty and help you to profit from the rebound. I'll also teach you how to develop the psychology of a winning investor and show you my ultimate investor's watch list of stocks that's going to lead the next bull market. So registration is opening really soon. Seats are very limited. Click on the link in the description right now to be placed on our event priority list and my team will send you an email invite really soon. So I look forward to seeing you at the event. Now on to the rest of the video. Now, I don't know exactly when that's going to happen, but it's, it's going to be in the second half of this year. Now, how about the recession issue that is causing the market to go down, the fear that we're going to go into a very deep recession? Now, here's the interesting thing. If you take a look at the media, you find that half the people are saying that we are already in a recession, like Kathy Wood and a few other people. But there are also people who are saying that, dude, where's my recession? That... The U.S. recession is not happening and that's not our base case. Even the New York Fed president is saying that and JP Morgan analysts are saying that as well. So why such a big difference? Well, it's because there are so many economic variables that are conflicting. There are some economic variables that are saying that we are in a recession and some that are saying that there's no recession. Okay, so there are too many moving parts, number one. Number two, there are different definitions of what a recession is. So some people think that a recession is defined as two quarters of negative GDP growth. We call that a technical recession, but not a real recession. It's kind of, kind of like a boxing match. A knockout is when you knock the person out. But sometimes you can have a technical knockout where you don't really knock the person out, but the referee says, well, he looks like he's not going to make it, he's not going to win, so it's a knockout, right? Now, that's not a real knockout. 
it's just being called by the referee. There's a technical knockout. So what's happening right now is some people are seeing a technical recession, but it's not really a recession recession, okay? In fact, if you take a look at the NBER, the National Bureau of Economic Research, they are the ones that officially declare recessions. And what they've said is that two consecutive quarters of decline in GDP is not how it's defined anymore because it's just a technical definition. Just because you get two quarters of negative decline doesn't really mean there is a recession. The guy is not really knocked out, okay? A recession is actually defined as a significant decline in economic activity spread across the economy, lasting more than a few months and visible in real GDP decline, real income decline, high unemployment, and of course, reduction in industrial production and wholesale retail sales. So let's take a look at the data and let's take a look at, is it a technical recession? Is it a real recession? And are we likely to have a severe recession? And you make your own decision based on this data. So first of all, you look at Q1, quarter one, GDP was minus 1.4%. And I've said before that this first quarter decline was not really a recession because it was not due to the drop in consumer spending or business spending. It was caused by an excess of imports versus exports that caused that negative figure. But never mind, let's put that aside. Now, what happened very recently on the 30th of June is that the Atlanta Fed GDP now tracker that tracks real-time economic data is forecasting that second quarter GDP will be minus 1%. So if we get minus 1.4% quarter one and minus 1% quarter two, hey, that's a recession. But again, it's a technical recession. Now bear in mind, this is not official because this number changes every few weeks. This could still turn positive again. So we will only know the actual quarter two GDP figure on the 20th of July. So if it's negative on the 20th of July, then it's a technical recession, which to me is not that concerning. Why? Because again, the market is behaving like it's going to be a severe recession. As long as we don't get a recession or we get a technical recession or a mild recession, the market is going to explode to the upside because it has overcompensated for the downside. So in other words, when things are not as bad as people think, the market will reverse the other way. So the question is, again, we don't care whether it's a technical recession, right? The question is, do we see a severe recession, the likes of the financial crisis and the dot-com crash? Based on the data, I don't think so. Why? So first of all, take a look at the household financial situation versus in past recessions. You can see this is the household debt servicing ratio which is debt payments as a percentage of income by households in the US. So the higher means the more debt they have versus their income. You can see that in during the dot-com crash, this was at about 11.5%. Uh, prior to the financial crisis, it was 13%. But right now, you can see that it is 9.5%. So household debt servicing ratio is a lot lower than it was in the previous two major recessions. Second, if you take a look at US households net debt levels, it is actually negative right now, which means that they have got more cash than debt on a national household level in the US. Once again, if you take a look at uh, the great financial crisis that happened over here back in uh, 2008, you can see that US households had a net debt of 4,000 per household, right? More debt than cash. Prior to the dot-com crash, it was also positive. They had more debt than cash. But right now, people have more cash than debt. So households have a lot more cash, which means they can weather a, a higher inflation prices better. In other words, they can still spend money because they've got more savings, all right? And if you read recently, California is giving each of their uh, uh, citizens $1,000 in inflation relief, which means more money to their pockets, 
So more consumer spending. And remember, consumer spending makes up 70% of GDP. As long as consumers still have cash, they are still spending, it's hard to get a severe recession in that situation. What else we look at? For there to be a big recession, you need to have high unemployment. That is the definition of a recession, high unemployment. Do we have that right now? So if you take a look at um, unemployment rate and wage growth. So we can see that right now, the unemployment rate has fallen all the way to here, which is 3.6%. So is that considered low, 3% unemployment rate? Well, again, let's compare that to the financial crisis. Uh, before the uh, great financial crisis, the unemployment rate was at 4.5%, even before it shot up to 10%. It was 4.5%, right? Uh, during the dot-com crash, you can see the unemployment rate prior to that was slightly above 4%. So currently at an unemployment rate of 3.6%, we're not there yet. Okay, again, it could rise, you never know, but it's, it's not showing, okay, a high unemployment rate. Wage growth, are wages growing? So currently wages are growing above 6%, as you can see here. Compared to during the um, dot-com crash, it was at 4% wage growth, financial crisis, 4% wage growth. So wages are growing higher than average. The average wage growth is 4%, we're now at 6%. The average unemployment rate in the last 50 years has been 6.2% and currently we're at 3.6%. So nothing in employment shows that we are in a deep recession or we are close to a deep recession. At least the data is not showing that. Ratio of job openings to job seekers Currently in May is 1.9. So for every one person looking for a job, there are two vacancies. So is that a sign of um, high unemployment and recession? Well, at least not yet. I don't see that in the data. If you take a look at leading in the economic indicators. So the one in red is the leading indicator. Okay, the one in blue is payroll employment. Uh, both different segments of payroll employment. Again, the shaded area would be previous recessions. Now, before the recession here, what happened? This leading indicator turned down recession, turned down recession. Before this recession, turned down recession. Okay, turned down recession, turned down recession. And of course, this recession came as a shock because it was the forced uh, global lockdown. So we don't really count that. Now, currently, leading indicators are still up here. Yep, they are flattening, as you can see, but we don't see any sharp drop, at least not yet. Same thing over here. You can see a slight little dip over there, but we do not see a significant drop in any of the leading economic indicators. So, in summary, technical recession, maybe. Mild recession, maybe. Severe recession, unlikely. So if inflation has peaked and if we're looking at just a technical recession or no recession or mild recession, where would the S&P 500 be by the end of the year? Would it rally back to all-time highs and get 0% return in 2022? Will it rally halfway so we're still down but not so much? Will we like go sideways to the end of the year so we end up where we are right now or could we have further downside? Find out in part two of this video. So be sure to subscribe so you get the first alert once the new video is released. I'll see you guys in the next video.